Uh, welcome to Stack Overflow, 100 million uniques per month on nine web servers. My name is David Haney. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. I'm kind of on hiatus right now um, because Twitter is a toxic, I've got to keep it PG, let's see. Twitter is a toxic negative place to be. And, uh, and so I'm on a breather from that. But anyway, uh, I work at Stack Overflow. This talks about Stack Overflow. How many people here don't know what Stack Overflow is? Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Um, the joke I always make is Stack Overflow is the world's first AI because all the programmers of Stack Overflow use Stack Overflow to build Stack Overflow. We just keep feeding it back into itself. Um, and then when it goes down, we're just, we're boned, everybody. So welcome. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a senior director of engineering at Stack Overflow. Sweet title. Um, yeah, I've been doing that for, for a while. Uh, I'm a craft beer, movie, and gaming nerd by night. Uh, when I'm not doing the engineering things. I currently oversee about 27 people. Uh, I run a part of our company. I've, I've run a lot of it. I ran the main site for many years, and then I ran some other stuff. And right now I run what's called the Teams product. Does anybody here use Stack Overflow for Teams? Right on. So yeah, so that's a product that my group manages and, and runs. We run four different platforms of it. Um, super fun. Uh, I won't talk a lot about it today, but it's a cool product. Basically, if you think of GitHub, public and private repos, StackOverflow.com is the public repo and Teams is the private repo. So you can ask questions and get answers and play the Stack Overflow game within your company and it's free for up to 50 users forever. So if you're a smaller company, no harm in checking it out. That's my plug. Um, my recent project is COVID Risk is, if you're interested, it's just an app that scrapes CDC data and then emails you when it changes so you can find out what the COVID risk is in your neighborhood. It's really bad in Duval right now, spoiler. There's probably 300 people here, one of them has COVID statistically. So watch yourself, get your shots, all that good stuff. Um, I've been at Stack Overflow for eight years. I joined in 2014 as a developer, and then depending on how you feel about managers, I was promoted or demoted in 2015 and been doing that ever since. And since I've been there eight years, that makes me a dinosaur. <laughs> Does anybody know who that is? Because now I'm like really old. Okay, a bunch of people know who Barney the Dinosaur is. Does anybody not know who Barney the Dinosaur is? It's okay, you can be honest. Young punks. <laughs> All right, first stop, let's go back in time, 2008. 2008's pretty sweet. A bunch of movies came out. The really weird Aliens Indiana Jones that was not good. I think that's Hulk. That's Zootopia. Iron Man? Madagascar. Kung Fu. Oh, Madagascar? I don't know. Uh, something I don't know the name of. Something I don't know the name of. Tropic Thunder, amazing movie. A bunch of other stuff came out. Daniel Craig's and something. Maybe that's Bond, I don't know. Cool, cool year, lots of stuff happening. Everything went to, went to crap. Uh, market crashed, if anybody, I actually graduated in 2008, so really great intro to the industry was everybody getting laid off and not being able to get a job, super sweet. Uh, yeah, market crashed, but also a website appeared on the internet, um, stackoverflow.com, and that's actually what it looked like in its infancy, and I can zoom in a little bit. Uh, pretty sweet design skills, right? Classic developer design skills, for sure. Um, and that's what the first version actually looked like as it came live. Uh, it launched, right? So the site went live in 2008. It was written in C Sharp 2.0 at the time, uh, .NET 2.0 specifically. Uh, Microsoft SQL, jQuery, and Subversion. Anybody use Subversion? It was, it was the cool thing until GitHub destroyed, well, Git destroyed it, and then GitHub destroyed everything. Um, everybody uses GitHub or Bitbucket, but mostly GitHub nowadays, which is uh, you know, a wrapper on the web over Git. Uh, why do we do that? That's what people knew. Right? So the people that founded the company, uh, three of them were active programmers day in, day out uh, at, the, at the Stack Overflow.com. And they had come from a contract at a 911 call center in Oregon where they wrote software to dispatch cop cars in .NET and later realized all the terrible mistakes they made and how, how probably liable they are for many accidents in Oregon area circa 2007, 2006. But that's, you know, they started with the technology that they knew, which is the key point. Right? And off-the-shelf tooling. ASP.NET MVC, version one or two at the time, I can't remember. Link to SQL, anybody use that? Still or we'll get to it. <laughs> Microsoft SQL and SQL Full Text Search. Anybody use SQL Full Text Search? Is it not like the worst thing ever? It just, right? But it works to start. Built-in output caching. There's a thing in MVC that's just output cache attribute that you can slap on methods to output cache. So that's how it started. What do we learn? Start with what you know. There's a theme in my presentation. I'm going to keep going back to the lessons learned and piling on. It's the whole point is to teach you how to scale a site. So lesson one is start with what you know. 
right? It removes barriers to entry, makes it simpler to immediately be productive and build things. And quite frankly, whether you want to have the holy war or not, most languages are all about equivalently good and frameworks and runtimes, right? So pick the one you know, whether it's .NET or Java. Java kind of sucks now because you got to pay for it, but .NET, Node, Python, Ruby, F Sharp if you're Brandon, whatever. Then the site gets popular and it starts to slow down quite a bit, right? As popularity gathers and, and people hit the site, it starts to not handle the load super well. It starts chugging and going down somewhat often. Don't know if any of you used the site back then, but it was down all the time initially. How do you fix it? Anybody? How do you fix something that's broken? One more in the back? Yeah, but if you don't have any money, well, you can break it more. You, you use tools, right? You use tools to fix things. So you need to measure your performance problems, right? But when we looked around at the time, we figured out that there were no profiling tools for .NET that were either affordable or good, or rather that were explicitly affordable and good. So we built one, right? Step one. This is called mini profilers. Anybody use this? Yeah, I have used it or used it now, either way. Mini Profiler is a thing that was built by, by Stack Overflow back in 2011. It launched. Anything in gold, by the way, on this presentation is a link, so later you can click through and take a look. Um, this is a really pretty, let me center that a little better. It's a really pretty impressive tool. You can plug this into your app, and uh, you don't want to run it for all the users all the time, so just run it for like your dev accounts or your admin accounts, and you can do that via cookie or otherwise, whatever makes you happy. Um, it'll tell you everything that's happening on your site by natively plugging into the profiling API of .NET, which still exists in .NET Core. This was actually, I did this on Friday. Friday night, I was, or Friday afternoon, I was finishing this up, and I took a, took a couple screenshots. So I'm on our Web04 server of Web01 through Web09, the nine web servers. It tells you, you know, the site I went to took 0.09 milliseconds to load the initial request, and then fetch took four milliseconds, and choose interesting posts took three but on the SQL end, it took 0.67, I think. And then get channels, interesting posts. Don't worry about that. But it's a thing that happens if you have a Teams account. It used to be called channels. And so a lot of the uh, infrastructure is under the hood is called channels. Pro tip, don't name your code after the name of your app. Because then when marketing changes the name of your app, your code doesn't change. So everything's still channels. Uh, anybody who uses Teams here, have you noticed the URL is slash C slash whatever? That C stands for channels, because it was originally called that. But this gives you insight, right? You can see exactly what's going on. You can see that Redis was 12% of it, SQL is 11% of it, HTTP is 46% of it. Um, you get a, a nice waterfall diagram of what's going on on the requests from the HTTP side on the client. You can see exactly how fast things are. Even cooler, you can drill way in. You can click through on any of these links here, and you can actually get this. This is rendered on the website live. You can get details of what's going on and how long it took, including a waterfall of timings. What's really interesting is you can get SQL, right? You can get SQL and see how long those requests are taking. And so now we're able to measure the performance. And if things aren't going well, you're going to see a bunch of stuff take way too long. And also, if it takes too long over here, it does alert with a red, red exclamation mark and, and various coloring to let you know that. So step one, measure things. Now you know what's slow. I am zoomed in. Profiling performance. Shows you where it's slow. Lets you make it fast. Verifies your fixes, right? You ever have that programmer moment where you're like, I think this is maybe what's wrong, and let's see if it works? It's really not good enough, right? It's, it's, I mean, it can be a fix, depending on the, the gravity of the thing you're fixing. But to take guesses like that, I mean, you're just playing Clue. Right? You really need to see and gain insight and visibility into what's going wrong and fix the actual things that are happening and not take guesses at what's happening because most of your guesses and my guesses will be wrong. I'm not judging you when I say that. We are all bad at guessing. It's a human brain thing. So not only do you start with what you know, you measure your performance. Keyword here with existing tools. Don't go reinvent your own performance profiler. We only did it because we had to. And now it's out there. It exists today. It works for .NET Core. It works for not .NET Core. If you're running .NET Stack, feel free to use it. It's free. It's open source. What did it reveal to us? 
on our slow website. We wrote some slow methods for sure, right? Programmers are prone to write maybe not the most optimized code, but also sometimes to over-engineer things. Interestingly, the .NET framework had serious flaws at the time. Love you, Microsoft. No hard feelings. But there's a reason that we've gone from version 2.0 all the way up to C sharp, I mean .NET 6 and on our way to 7. Right? Huge incremental improvements in the framework. It's never been in better shape. But back then, there were some serious problems in the actual guts of the thing. And we can see that through the profiler. How do you fix it? So we start fixing our own problems, our own slowness. Well, you realize that nothing is free. All created things in your code, pretty much no matter what language you use, or framework you use, or runtime you use, they cost something. They cost CPU to create, they cost memory to hold. And generally, memory is finite. It's cheap these days, but it's still finite. And also, what is created must be destroyed eventually. Calculations are expensive, right? Doing a reporting, a classic thing I think of is like report roll-ups, like give me the monthly stats on whatever. It's a ton of summing and averaging and aggregations. Those things are not free or cheap either. A GC is a garbage collector. Any managed uh, language, managed memory language, will have a garbage collector that is usually uh, generational, uh, meaning that it progressively tries to reclaim things you're no longer using through what's called a pinning system. They're tricky. And the further you go in generations, like the .NET one starts in Gen 0 and goes to Gen 3, and each step is about 10 times worse than the prior ones. So if you let things live long enough and they get reclaimed in Gen 2, it can actually freeze your entire application while it recollects everything and then resumes your application. So what is created must be destroyed, right? Laws of physics, matter can only be converted, yada, yada. You have to pay attention to that if you're going for scale. So you need to employ some techniques like caching, optimization, and object pooling to fix these problems, and that's what we did. So caching, or the fancy programming term memoization, which nobody ever uses, is the idea of storing the output of a method after you run it once, or uh, almost once, depending on your race conditions, to then return immediately in future requests. So the typical pattern to this is when you call into a method, you go, do I have the answer? Return it. If not, do the work, store it, then return it. And that way, the next person goes, hey, I need that thing. You go, oh, it's right here, boom, it's done. No more work, right? Think monthly reports. You ran the monthly report. When they reload the page, are you running it again? Did anything change? Like, especially if it's in the past. If I'm running a report on May, it probably didn't change in the six seconds of July that I spent reloading the page, right? So store it. Store the output. And then the next time that somebody reads the report, it's instant. And they go, wow, you're a really good developer. This app's so fast. And you're like, great, give me more money. <laughs> right? Super powerful. What it does is it trades CPU time and or external services, databases, webhooks, yada, yada, for memory. You're putting the output in memory. Again, memory is not free, but you have to make these heuristical trade-offs intelligently. What are the things that are worth keeping in memory? What are the things that are worth not keeping in memory and just doing over and over? I can't answer that. That's a question that's very specific to your application architecture and your goals. You can cache locally or remotely. Start locally, because when you get to remotely, you end up doing some serialization and deserialization, and that's expensive too, and it goes over the wire, and now you're paying for bandwidth, and so on and so forth. So really, like as programmers, I think you'd all secretly admit to yourselves late at night when you're being introspective and honest with yourself that we all over-engineer a lot of things. right? Like We start to build an app, and we're like, well, in the future, when I'm the next Mark Zuckerberg, it's going to need to do this, so I'm going to tack on like distributed caching and elastic. It's like you don't, we don't actually need these things. So try to really rein yourself in and not over-engineer the thing and just worry about getting version 1 out the door and seeing if anybody even cares. Because I can't tell you, I mean, I can't speak for anybody else, but I've spent so many years of my life trying to build something interesting for people to use, and then I over-engineer it for a year, I release it, and I expect fireworks, and I get silence. And nobody cares, and it never gets used, and then I decommission it six months later and move on to the next one, right? It wasn't until I figured out that if I just focus on the market fit and put something out there as fast as I can, even if it's written poorly, it's still more valuable than over-engineering something that nobody uses. So don't over-engineer your stuff. Start local with caching, which is just putting it in memory. In .NET, there's something called a memory cache object that you can use that's really uh, uh, performant, works really well for this. Don't invent your own caching, please. <laughs> Back to comp side degrees, or lack thereof. If you don't have one, you still got to understand this. No big deal. So LIFO and FIFO just means last in, first out, and first in, first out. 
So these uh, caches that store things, they don't store things forever because that's a memory leak, right? And then eventually your app gives you a stack overflow exception or an out of memory exception, which is really hard to debug because you can't actually trace an out of memory exception because there's no memory to trace it. So uh, what these things do is they, in, they involve a queue and they, uh, when they reach a certain memory percentage or pressure, they eject either the first thing you put in or the last thing you put in or some other algorithm. Um, and generally, these caches use what's called LRU, or least recently used as an algorithm. So they eject the thing that's oldest, which makes sense, right? That way you kind of keep your cache fresh and the old things go away. Caching is terrific for read often, write rarely loads. And the reason for that is, if you're writing all the time, then you can't really rely on the caching because the caching is always a snapshot from the past and it's out of date. So think about that report I was talking about. If you're, if you're running a report for the last month, that's a great thing to cache. It's not changing. But if you're trying to keep up with, say, real-time dollars earned on the website of our e-commerce solution, right? Like maybe you work at Fanatics and you're trying to track the dollars by the minute that are coming in during peak season, you're not caching that. Or if you are caching that, you're probably fired. Um, it depends on your, on your problem space and your tech stack and what's acceptable to you, but think about the things in your application that you can store a snapshot of that's in the past and do that, right? And when you do that, you offload calculations in CPU, you trade it for memory, but you get performance out of it. Optimization, general concept. Um, there's no silver bullet here, but it's really mostly about understanding both the complexities of algorithms and how to simplify them. Like this is where you start to talk big O notation. I don't like to do that because it's very scientific and mostly theoretical and not that useful. But you know, if you could take like a loop nested in a loop nested in a loop and smash it down to just one loop, that's going to be a big performance improvement depending on how often that's run. If it's run once a month, maybe you don't care. If it's run all the time, you do care. So again, in the garbage collector, what is created must be later destroyed. A common pitfall that I see in most languages, and not all, is string concatenation, right? So an example from .NET. In .NET, strings are not actually value types, though they behave like them. They are immutable reference types. Immutable meaning read-only. And what that means is, when you do this command, when you add a string to another string, you concatenate it like, hello, your name here, you're actually creating a new object. It's not adjusting a string. It's creating a new string and then letting go of those other two strings. Well, that's an object created that costs time and memory and CPU, and it eventually has to be collected. And if your string lives long enough, it's going to be collected in the Gen 2 of the garbage collector, and it's going to pause your whole app. So the solution in this specific case is something called a string builder. Has anybody used that or familiar with that? What it does is it runs a byte buffer under the hood, and it actually does adjust your string on the fly with the byte buffer. And that's a more, you know, when you get to the point where you're concatenating strings all the time, which you're probably not, but it's just an isolated example, Something like that or being aware of that kind of solution is going to help you optimize your application because even though it's a string builder in C-sharp specifically, there's going to be an equivalent in Java and Node and everything else. I think it's called string buffer in Java. I don't remember. It's been 10 years since I did Java. But every language is going to have solutions for these kinds of problems because they're generally written by smarter people than us or at least smarter people than me, I should say. I don't know how smart you are all. You're probably geniuses. But for me, they're, they're written by people smarter than me and they've thought through these problems. So. They let you do the easy stuff because often it doesn't matter, but they give you tools for the more complicated stuff if it becomes a problem. Try to use those tools. Object pooling. Does anybody know what that is? Guy with hand up? Uh, basically, it uh, takes all the objects you have and puts them together in one spot with uh, object cache, essentially. Yeah, it's like caching the set of objects. That's pretty right. So object pooling is the idea that if you're creating the same object a lot, just start reusing it. Don't create it and destroy it and create it and destroy it. Store it and just keep reusing it. Store n copies of the object in a queue, push to the queue when you're done with it, and pop to the queue when you need it. Right? We actually did this with string builders way early in the day because we found that even string builders were costing us because we have such a high traffic load that we'd create a string builder, do some work, destroy it, and that was a problem. So we actually put the string builders in a queue. And all you have to do is the string builder runs a byte array, all you have to do is set the index to zero. It's just like deleting a file on your disk. It doesn't actually delete the file. It just marks the index as writable. And then anything overwritten is good. It's the same exact thing. So reset or reinitialize it on push. Don't forget to do that, or you're going to get some really weird garbled stuff. 
Um, in string builder example, it's just setting the index to zero, current index to zero, but in other cases, it might be reinitializing your data object or your database accessor or whatever it is you're storing. Um, reusing objects is sort of, kind of, if you look at it, fuzzy constant memory. It costs you holding the memory, but the memory that you're holding is cheaper and reserved and done, and you're no longer doing that garbage collector dance of I created, I destroyed it, I created, I destroyed it, and the garbage collector's trying to keep up and recycle all the memory that you're using all the time. Does that make sense? Sweet. So I put a link to an object pool that I wrote back in like 2015. It's a little bit dated. It could probably be better, but it's, it's something you can look at to see what I mean by this. I wrote a generic one, um, object pool of type T, so you can just store something, and it also takes a, a lambda expression, so you can pass a reset, reinitialize method to it, and it'll run that reinitialize when you push to reset the object for you. So we fixed our stuff, right? We got through our app, we saw where our code wasn't working very well, and we really worked hard to fix that. But we found that despite our best efforts, the framework was still pretty slow. .NET 2.0, you know, it was awesome. I loved it, cut my teeth on it, really enjoyed it, but it had problems. So link to SQL was actually very slow in 2011. Uh, it's pretty good these days for some cases. I, I don't want to deter you, and that's why I said in 2011, you know, 11 years ago. Um, but it was pretty bad back then. It had a lot of inefficiencies. It did a lot of object creation and and then the garbage collector got a lot of pressure and so on and so forth. Entity Framework 4, which is what was out at the time, was also slow. It's also really good these days, actually, recent benchmarks, it's pretty much on par with, with most popular ORMs, so there's nothing wrong with using it at this point. But again, 11 years ago, it was slow. But we still needed to access the database, and we weren't going to write all that mapping code. Has anybody here written and used like SQL data reader code themselves under the hood, where it's like, you get back your set of fields and you have to look them up by name and cast them to object types and what happens if they don't cast correctly and then you have to put them into an object and what if you change the database, it's, it's ugly. And you don't really want to spend your time writing this code. It's going to take you years. It's a bad use of your time and the company's money. So we need to use a better .NET ORM. But we look around and one doesn't exist yet. So what do we do? We write one. Right, so this was originally called SAMS ORM, named after Sam Saffron, one of the smartest people I've ever had the pleasure of meeting and knowing and working with. Um, absolute genius. Uh, he decides that he's gonna take on building an ORM because what we have isn't working and we don't wanna manually do it. This is what it looks like even today. You can say var cars is con.query of type car, select whatever from cars to list, and you get an, a list of objects that are populated with the data from your table. It's that simple. And this is way back in the day, circa 2011 from Sam's blog, a benchmarking he did of the various ORMs at the time. If he hand coded it, it was 164 milliseconds. Linked to SQL was 335 seconds, milliseconds, pardon me, of which 207 were compiling primitives and other uh, metadata around it. Executing was 242 milliseconds on top of that. Sam's ORM, soon to be dapper, was 174 total. Entity framework was half a second three times slower. So maybe that doesn't matter if you're building an app that 10, 15 people use, but maybe it matters if your stack overflow and you're starting to get huge amounts of traffic, right? Cutting 66% of the response time out, big deal. So this was pretty close to hand-coded, right? Hand-coded 164, a little bit of overhead, maybe 8% overhead. Not a bad trade, faster than everything out there. And that eventually became What's known now as Dapper also launched in 2011. And what it does, as I was telling you, is it takes the columns in your tables and it converts them to your DTOs or POCOs, or you want to call them your, your data transfer objects, your, your .NET objects that are naive. They know nothing about the database, but when you call the methods, it automatically maps them for you. And you can specify that product ID should be, you know, prefix of product, I just want ID and name and price, and it does all the casting and everything for you automatically. It actually writes code and compiles it in real time under the hood and then saves it and keeps using it. Great tool. Um, here's where you get it. It's still in use. We use it constantly, day in, day out. I highly recommend it because I personally am kind of a control freak who likes to have granular control over my SQL. Entity framework can but does not always provide that, but it is a great alternative. I'm not gonna, not gonna bad mouth it. It's in good shape. So what do we learn there? Fix and replace the slow once you measure it, but again, use existing tools. Don't write your own ORM, right? In 2011, which was like the wild west of the current state of web, what are we at, web 4.0? I don't know, crypto web. Um, the state we're in now, 
you know, I, I hate to sound like an old guy, but you all have never been luckier. None of us have. Like, there's a smorgasbord of really excellent apps and open source software out there, totally free, literally served to you on a plate with maintainers and like quality control that you can employ to solve your problems. Don't invent them. Unless you really want to learn, then invent them on your own time. But don't do that on your company dime, right? Um, terrible story. In 2010 through 2013, I worked at a local shop called Fanatics. Anybody here from Fanatics? Some, I think I saw somebody raise their hand. You can blame me for TCS, you can blame me for Phoenix, you can blame me for Weblink, you can blame me for all kinds of old stuff there. Um, we needed to fix our search engine. We wrote a proprietary one, it didn't work. What did I do, because I'm so smart? I said, hey, Elasticsearch isn't good enough for us, I'm going to invent one. I wrote my own search engine. Terrible piece of garbage. Terrible. Like, it worked better than what we had, but it was a far cry from anything good or scalable, and I'm pretty sure, hopefully, it doesn't exist today. It better not. <laughs> um, terrible. And that was just nothing but my ego speaking, right? Reality is, Elasticsearch was out. Yeah, it was, a, you know, nine years younger than it is, or, or, yeah, younger than it is now, but it worked great. It solved the problem. I should have just employed it. I could have spent the six months, seven months I spent writing this piece of junk just spent one month employing Elasticsearch, setting it up with queries and data structures, and I'm done. Problem solved. I mean, as a developer, whatever, I get a salary. As a company owner, think about the money saved and not spent there. Dev salary plus maintenance plus how many hours of pain I've caused that company. I'm so sorry, Fanatics, for writing that crummy search engine. Right? So use existing tools. They're out there. They solve the problem. If you have that glimmer of it's not good enough for us, not, not invented here syndrome is what it's called, really reevaluate your priorities because it very likely is. And if everybody else can use it and it works for them, odds are it works for you unless you're on the extreme bleeding edge of something nobody else is doing like quantum computing or space physics, which most of us aren't. Let's be real. We're not you know, launching rockets, saving babies, any of that stuff. So just use the stuff that's out there. It's cheap and it's fast and it works. I'm really trying to drill this lesson into you, right? So now we've got tons of traffic and things are going a bit better, sites staying up, but this traffic is generating tons and tons of logs, right? Does everybody here log their traffic? Hopefully, yes, sweet, good, you kind of need to. We're logging in the SQL table. I want to be clear, there's nothing wrong with doing that. In fact, we still do that, but the problem with logging in a SQL tail, table, just row after row after row, is it's really hard to grok, and grok just means to like investigate and search and figure out, right? Like, tough to see trends, tough to see errors and groups and counts of things. Like, if somebody says to you, hey, what's the average error is a minute? So just start thinking about how you write that query against the SQL table. It's like, well, select the timing of the request, group by the minute rounded up for the last 24 hours, and suddenly your query plan is is an essay and your SQL server's falling over. And that's if you even get it right, which you won't because, well, I don't know if you won't. I definitely won't. I'm so bad at writing these queries, right? Jeff Taylor might, but the rest of us won't. And this is hard to do. And so what happens, right? We're developers and we lazy load everything. And so we look at this and we go, that's too hard. And we just don't do it, right? And now your logs, like, is anybody here willing to admit it? Like you're piling up your logs in your database. Are you doing anything with them? And in which case, what's the point? It costs money to store it and network bandwidth and everything, right? Like Microsoft's just racking up the tab. They're like, sweet, welcome to Azure. Thanks for using our database, <laughs> right? Like, but you're not doing anything with it. So you need to use a log aggregator to make that stuff super accessible because if you make it accessible, people will start paying attention to it and using it. And you can build features onto it like, say, emailing people when there are too many exceptions or shouting an alert in Slack when there's a 500 error on the site. Anything and everything you, your mind imagines. Try doing that from SQL. Now you're running, what's the thing in SQL where you can run the shell? You can run commands against the native Windows environment. It's like you can, you can execute things in SQL. If you're really crazy, you can make it run like executable. So you could probably write SQL that will send an email, but now you're really, your DBA is gonna find out where you live and stab you. <laughs> so you're not gonna do that. So you need a log aggregator. But we looked around and what didn't exist yet. So what did we do? We built one. This is called OpServer. It's written in .NET, but it's not specific to .NET, and that's the cool thing. Let me zoom in on that a little bit. So it's a log aggregator. Let me try and get a better view of it. It's a log aggregator that tells you you can filter your exceptions by the particular part of your app you're on. 
Just ignore that we have 10,107,820 exceptions as of Friday. But it'll tell you a lot of interesting stuff. This is a lot easier to look at than a SQL database. And, and I had to cut off the side because there's some PII there, like people's IP addresses. But another thing it does is it aggregates. It says, by the way, there have been 650 of these in the last two minutes. And it'll highlight that. So, you know, timeout performing a scan, which is a Redis command. Unexpected error when attempting to delete user. Scheduled iterable sync. Iterable is our email provider for certain things. Should return via schedule complete, and it didn't. A public action method, send invoice payment reminders was not found. That's probably a problem. <laughs> right? People aren't going to get their invoices. They're not going to pay us. You know, you get some very useful info here. You can save the logs. You can delete the logs and clear them out. You can filter the logs by the particular part of the app you're in. Very useful. I'm going to try and resume this a little bit. I don't need to zoom that. So this is another page that's very useful. Top hit routes last 30 days. You don't need to write it. It's written for you. Right? Questions show. What a surprise. Everybody's looking at questions on Stack Overflow. That's the number one page. Here's what's really cool about this. Uh, it's been hit 981 million times, almost 982 million times in the last 30 days. Average total 15 milliseconds. Average breakdown, 13 milliseconds, 4 milliseconds of SQL. This is, a, this is a special syntax that you learn if you start playing with Op Server. Average SQL in the last 24 hours, 4 milliseconds. Right? User shows the next popular. And you can also see performance over time. You can see where it got weird. You can go investigate it. You can actually highlight that in the app and say, OK, what day and time is this? Go compare it to SQL, et cetera. Super useful tooling. I hope that that's pretty obvious in seeing this compared to a flat file of logs. Even better, top SQL queries on your SQL server by average CPU per minute. What's up? What is this plugin against? What's the underlying logic? It uses something called stackexchange.exceptional to store your logs in a database in a particular format. So it's proprietary, but it's yours to play with as open source as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You don't need to store your logs in SQL particularly. You just need to store them in a certain format so it can aggregate off of them. But so take a look at this. Top queries on the SQL server per minute, right? This is microseconds, which I don't want to do any math. It's, what is it, Tuesday morning? I don't know. I haven't had enough coffee. But it runs a lot. This, this particular select count star query is number one. It's run for a total of four days and 16 hours in the last minute. Think about that. Right? So you need to look at that and go, that's my hot path. I need to tune the ever living heck out of that and make sure it works right and it's efficient. And even better, if I can, in this case I can't, but if I can, cache it. Let us not go into the database. Um, we write our, our SQL inline and we actually use a, uh, a uh, uh, analyzer, a .NET analyzer, to add in the method, like the controller and or class and the line that the code is at. And so that way, when you're looking at this, you actually know where to go. You go, OK, I go to comment.cs line 742 to review this query. Right? If you're using stored procs, you can do it in the database. Tomato, tomato, they're pretty much equivalent these days. There's pros and cons to each. I don't want to get into it. But which way you do it, if you put it in you know, your app, you can actually see a lot of detailed info alongside of your app like this. So make sure that you're looking at and reviewing the pain points of your database and your logs in general, and not just storing them into SQL and hoping that works somehow or somebody else. You know, it's somebody else's problem. DBAs will figure it out. They won't, pro tip. It's not that they're not smart enough, it's that they got other stuff to do. And they don't care about your logs. And you don't care about your logs. And now nobody cares about your logs. And your logs are wasted. Lesson four. Logs are a gold mine, but only if you mine them. Right? It's very rare that you get to actually actively see in real time what your users are doing. You're going to have to rely on logging. And if you look at it, you can get a lot of good insight and details, not just performance related, but actually even marketing or sales related sometimes, patterns. But if you just let them sit there and rot, they're useless. Yeah? Do you love mini profiler and look at that? Is that what that's based off? Or uh, no, mini profiler is different. It runs real time in the application without it. No, we don't log the database. Uh, well, we, we log similar stats through this, but not from MiniProfile. MiniProfile doesn't back itself on a database at all. We got 26 minutes left, and I'm on slide 27 to 42. That's pretty good. Here's the thing. Your app, unless it's very static, which it never is, because if it is, they don't hire you to work on it, your app has a database. Anybody here is app not have some kind of database? Right. If you look around awkwardly, nobody put their hand up. Every app has a database. Every database is slow. I don't care what you use. 
SQL, NoSQL, Mongo, flat file, CSV, Excel. What's that terrible access, Microsoft Access? <laughs> They're all slow by their nature. They're not in your application's memory, so there's serialization. There's network latency. Weirdly, the thing that we come up against as the worst offender for our performance for our database is the speed of light. I know that sounds insane, but it's true. You can't actually improve upon it. It is a hard limit in this possibly simulated world. It's a constant. So your database is always slow. 90% of the time that your app falls over, guess what? It's the database. It's the query that isn't actually covered by an index or whatever and runs poorly and then it starts to back itself up and then somebody says, hey, let's set max stop to one to fix it and then it really falls over. If you don't know what max stop is, delete that from your mind, never think of it again. <laughs> Basically tell SQL to use one core instead of all the cores to single thread everything back to back to avoid blocks. But of course, think about the implications of sending a queue of one thing at a time. So you need to tune your database, not just once and call it good, constantly. You need to probably hire somebody to monitor the bloody thing whose only job, who is literally Jeff Taylor, whose only job is to stare at it, figure out what's not working, and tune it, and then stare at what's still not working, and tune it. Because as you remove the slow, the next thing in line becomes the slow. And there's an endless amount of things to fix. On top of that, most apps are being constantly built. Right? You all are probably employed, not unlike myself, to add features and bolt things onto an app, which means new queries and new tables and new columns and new problems for that person to fix. In a smaller startup, maybe you're the one-stop shop person who does the code and the SQL. That's fine. That's how we started, too. We didn't have any DBAs till 2016, and now we have like six of them because we realized how crazy it was to rely on devs being DBA experts and that you know, people who are specialized to the job are generally pretty darn good at it. Use indexes and covered queries. I have a whole talk on this that I'm not going to give you, but um, it pays to know your SQL or at least hire somebody who does. Right? Indexes are very powerful. Covered queries are the concept that all the columns you're selecting are covered by an index, which massively improves the performance of your application. Generally, SQL will fall into one of two things, either a seek or a scan. Right? One of them is looking up directly via index where something is, and the other one is literally like picking up an encyclopedia and going page by page, reading everything until you find what you want. And the problem with that is immediately obvious. The more data you have, the more users you have, the longer that takes. It is the definition of the n plus 1 problem. And then it gets worse and worse and worse, and it falls over. And then when it falls over doing that, it actually breaks itself because the next person trying to do that same query waits for that and then that makes it worse and that makes it worse and the whole thing snowballs out of control and your app falls over and somebody says, what's going on? And you're like, no idea. It's your database. Is anybody willing to admit that they have an app that runs with no lock on every query? It's not good. Generally means it's not set up right. I'm not going to judge it because there are cases where it's useful. It creates a dirty read. Where you don't want a dirty read is an important real-time analytics like money. Right? If you, it's, it's basically a form of caching. It takes a snapshot of the table without blocking it, but anything that's currently happening on the table is not included in that. Sometimes it makes sense, but if everything is just with no lock and if your blanket like best practice is do everything with no lock, it's not good. Right? I'm not here to judge anybody, but that's something to reevaluate the structure of and purpose of your database. To that end, Try a read-only replica. We run SQL in tandem. We have active read-write and passive availability group read-only. And we do all the queries off the read-only. And that immediately reduces blocks to none. Because when everything is just read-only, how do you block? You can read simultaneously. It doesn't hurt anything. You're not mutating state, right? This is the power of immutable code, immutable methods. They're automatically thread safe. And so if you have an immutable database, it's always thread safe. However, a tiny bit behind reality, right? Is, is the right one then, does it need indexes? Oh, it needs indexes. Okay. It definitely needs indexes. But it needs indexes for a lot of reasons, including to put things in the right place quickly. Um, and every time you do an insert, the more indexes you have that right. are touched by the insert, the more you need to rebake the indexes and stuff gets crazy. But it's, it's a whole talk. I don't want to dive into it. It's just it pays to know SQL. And you can employ strategies like a read-only replica to get rid of all your with no lock stuff. So we literally have uh, a variable for our write database and a variable for our read database. And so we read data 
from the read database, and we write to the write database, which propagates to the read database in the availability, availability group under the hood, we don't have to worry about it. Suddenly, we don't have a lot of locks and blocks. Measure your queries. Again, OpServer can be helpful for that. Here's another little picture of the thing I showed you earlier. If you don't know what your hot queries are and what's the most expensive and how it's performing and the average time it takes, then again, you're playing the game of Clue. And the game of Clue is, is not a fun game. I don't know if you've played it recently, but it's pretty terrible. Um, you're just like, it's somebody in, the, in the, the game parlor with an ax or a pen knife or I don't know, all kinds of crazy stuff. But the point is, you're probably wrong. They're like, nope, that's not right. You're like, well, I lost the game, cool. Um, that's what guessing does. You don't want to guess, you want to know. You want to act on information, not on uh, intuition, because human intuition is notoriously terrible. So that lesson is measure and tune your database. Right? If you're not doing that, that's probably the most impactful thing you could do today, I would argue, because most apps run on the database. The database is usually what fails. Again, we like to over-engineer things. As developers, defer your complexity. It's great to think about what I might need next month or next week or next year if we go big. Don't do it. Lazy load it. Don't do it till you have to do it. It's not a problem, right? Our initial tools worked well for years. You notice we launched in 2008, but we didn't have to switch off Link to SQL until 2011. That's three years of not having to solve that problem, right? Performance issues didn't start to fall over for three years. That's three years of not having to solve that problem and work out other things, right? Database was okay for three years. Again, three years of not having to solve that problem. As load caused the tools to fail, we adjusted and re-implemented. And how do we do that? We measured to know that that's what was failing. So we ended up from going from traditional ASP.NET to .NET Core. .NET Core is awesome. Microsoft has fixed virtually everything that has ever been a problem in .NET. It's never been in better shape, and it runs on all kinds of systems. You run on Linux. It's awesome. It's amazing. Um, and pro tip, if you have a .NET app in Azure, running it on Linux is one-fourth the cost of running it on Windows, which I found out because I didn't want to pay 50 bucks a month to run COVIDRisk.is. So I was like, I'll pay $13 a month. That sounds a lot better. Um, we adapted to .NET Core because it solved problems. We had actually, in the original MVC, we had Frankenstein it. We had written our own routing, MVC routing. You know MVC routing out of the box? We had to rewrite it from scratch. And actually, we patched it back to Microsoft for future versions of, of MVC because we were needing to improve upon the efficiency of the pattern matching, basically. There were problems there. Um, we did patches. We actually found back in the day when Ryu, does everybody know what the Ryu JIT is? There's a new just-in-time compiler that came out with .NET back a couple of years ago, and it was designed to enable a couple of things like those plug inable uh, analyzers. It actually had a, a tail call bug, and we caught it and we patched it with Microsoft. Like, these things happen. Microsoft's not perfect, you're not perfect, I'm not perfect, I'm really far from perfect. And uh, you need to just only solve the problem when it becomes a real problem. So, Link to SQL became dapper once it became a problem. SQL full text search became a problem eventually because by its nature, it's really hard to cover it in a query and so it just, it tends to fall over pretty fast. There's nothing wrong with using it initially, but we eventually went to Elasticsearch, right? And the thing about Elasticsearch is it runs on Java and the thing about Java is it runs way better on Linux than it does on Windows. So we actually run our Elasticsearch servers on Linux, even though our Windows shop, because it's the most performant, better, more memory efficient way to do it. And it's not that hard to maintain. Built-in output caching eventually became a Redis implementation. So Redis is a, if you're not familiar, it's, a, it's not even a distributed cache. It's just a memory store that you host outside of your app. And so the problem with caching locally eventually is if you have nine web servers, you're caching nine times the stuff. Each server has to locally cache its own copy. And that tends to scale poorly after a while, but it's great for many years, perhaps. At that point, you go to a singular cache point so that everything benefits. All the servers benefit from any server's performance and caching work. However, you're now trading costs again. You're saving memory and performance, but now you're going over the wire with serialization and deserialization. So nothing is free. These are all just heuristical trade-offs you have to make based on your specific application and the problems you're trying to solve. So what do we learn? Solve actual problems, not future ones. And again, I'm not judging you. So many times I have over-engineered my apps. I built a freaking search engine I didn't need to build, right? I didn't solve the actual problem, which was just make search better. I could have just used Elasticsearch and be done, right? Um, great example. Does anybody here, not unlike myself, get into the habit of just writing an interface for every class? 
Because you're like, yeah, it's native DI, I should have an interface. I mean, how often do you actually use that interface? How often do you ever put a second class in that implements that interface? Basically never. Maybe you have a payment interface and you switch from one provider to another and so you do that. Or maybe a search interface, right? That's a great example. You have a search interface, the implementation is SQL full text, you switch it to Elasticsearch, it still works. But in general, you're building a bunch of interfaces that just sit there and do nothing. And you argue, well, yeah, testability, yada, yada, yada. Well, you're right, but the thing is, I can actually mock a class just as easily as I can mock an interface. So you don't need interfaces for everything. Try to build interfaces around the edges of your app, and the edges are where you start to talk to other apps, because those are the implementations that are going to change. So these kinds of premature optimizations, they seem innocuous, but if you realize that you're building 100 interfaces for 100 classes, maybe that costs you eight hours. Think about your salary. Think about eight hours of it. It's not free, and as a developer, whatever, I'm getting paid, but as a company owner, that's money spent on stuff that isn't used. Of course, if you work for a place that comes down on you for writing interfaces, then maybe it's not a great place. But, but my point is, try to solve real things as they come up. Be, be the lazy developer at heart that we all are, and don't, don't kick the can down the road until you have to fix it, and then fix it. Don't just fix it now. So fast forward out of 2011 over to 2014. What's happening with Stack Overflow? We are the 54th most visited website in the world at this time. This is no longer true, but it was true back then. 110 network sites, and we started to use the same code base to run multiple network sites. We have lots of sites, like we have a, a homeowner's one, like a DIY one. We have a math one that's really popular. We have one that's on world building, which we all thought was going to flop, and it's the coolest thing ever. It's like a bunch of authors who are like, in the world of dragons, if I had a dragon that breathed this kind of fire, what temperature would it have to be to melt this person's sword? And it's like, <laughs> it's the cool, like if you ever get bored, just go look up the world building stack exchange and just start reading. It is amazing stuff. It's like, it's one of the most popular sites now and we all thought it was gonna flop, which is, again, our intuitions are bad. Oh, and the way we do this is, based on the domain you come in on, we then serve you the particular database of branding, right? So the one app serves multiple sites, multiple, multifaceted, multi-tenant. 4 million users at the time, 8 million questions, 40 million answers, 560 million page views a month, which is quite a few. Almost 20 million a day. Just 25 servers total. Right? Anybody here running more than 25 servers? You can admit it. Pro probably almost everybody's running more than 25 servers. And so here's the thing, if your code is measured and fixed and things are performing really well and your performance is tuned up and your database is good, you need less hardware. And hardware for you and me is cheap. Hardware for servers is expensive. You don't want to know what a Dell blade costs. You don't want to know, okay? 80,000 and up per server, right? Again, not your paycheck, great, but you run a company, it's a big expense. You need nine servers, that's almost three quarters of a million dollars. Minimum, plus service contracts, plus, plus, plus. Plus, you got to go host it in a data center or in the cloud. And if you're in the cloud, they're going to literally run a meter by the second. And if you're in a data center, you're going to have to pay people to go and maintain that stuff. And what happens when a drive fails? And who's your CDN? And who's your network provider? And how do you get all that stuff going? And bandwidth isn't cheap. Performance saves you a ton of money. It's a cost-saving feature as well as just a feature for your app. It's well known that in, in the various major search engines, really just Google and Bing, that run the internet, one of the heuristics they use to rate your site is how fast it is. Slower sites get deranked. Performance can be a feature to a site. If you want more traffic, the faster your site responds, the higher it's going to go in the search engine because they're like, this is a better quality output. This is a better quality site than its competitors. And that could be a strategic advantage. More importantly, cost saving. 25 servers, pretty cheap, relatively speaking, especially for being the 50-something, 54th, I think I said, most traffic site in the world. Just think of how many servers Twitter or Facebook has to run and what that cost is, right? And they probably also optimize, to be fair. They probably do a lot better than we do even, um, and we do pretty well. But the point is, if you're not optimizing for performance, you're spending extra on servers that you may not need. And that can be a very expensive thing. So performance is a feature. Where are we at today, literally today? 179 network sites, including world building. You gotta check out world building, it's so cool. 1.3 billion monthly page views across the whole network, right? It's all running on the same app, but it's, you know, 179 different sort of fronts to it via different domain names. 51.2 million unique Stack Overflow visitors per month. 
just stackoverflow.com. Bunch more millions, over 100 million, including the whole network. 22.8 million questions and 33.7 million answers. I don't know how I went from 40 million to 33.7 million answers. I must have got that heuristic wrong because there's no way we lost answers. So I apologize. It's probably closer to 70 million. I think I fat fingered that. Still just the 25 web servers today. Eight years of scale for free, relatively free. You got your photo, so make sure you get photo. Sweet. So here's how it looks. This is the breakdown. Nine web servers plus two. These two are sort of corollary servers for things like builds and CI, CD. We don't really use them to serve traffic at all. Um, nine web servers. Each of them handles 300 requests a sec with a peak of 450. They have 64 gigs of RAM. They run an average of 5%, or pardon me, they run an average of 5% CPU and 12% peak. All right? There's a lot of room for growth there. Could get eight times worse. Not quite, but it's kind of a naive assumption, but you know, that's the thing. Here's what's really neat. We can actually run the whole thing on one web server, and we've done it. We haven't done it intentionally. <laughs> <laughs> we crashed a bunch of stuff. It got down to one web server, and it was, it was running hot, but it worked. And we were, we were both like, this is terrifying and awesome, right? Like, it was kind of cool. I mean, in theory, realistically, we could run this on less web servers, looking at this CPU. We could run this on four or three. But we decided nine is a good number for a bunch of reasons, including future plans and how we plan to build things on top, such as Stack Overflow for Teams. Yes? What's the RAM allocation like? Can you be more specific? Oh, like totally maxed out, completely, yeah. The RAM is all maxed out with caching. Not a surprise, right? You run your memory cache. Memory cache has a great heuristic where it keeps your memory ramped up, but it also evicts the least recently used. So the RAM, rest assured, is running super hot, on fire. But the CPU, which is a much more impressive metric, <laughs> 5%. We have four SQL servers. We have two clusters, one active, one hot standby. One of them by itself runs Stack Overflow. One of them runs literally everything else because Stack Overflow is that popular. They run at 4% CPU, peak 15. They have one and a half terabytes of RAM on about three terabytes of database size, which means, and SQL is really good at caching things in memory without you knowing it's doing it, which means it caches about half the data at any given time, give or take, which is a very useful thing. And then everything else runs on the other servers, similar, less RAM, Less database, actually more database size, pardon me, but less RAM, and it's a little less frequently trafficked, so we get away with it. 6%, peak 14. 528 million queries a day with a peak of 11,000 per second. And over here, 496 and 12,800. Right? So, how many databases do you have? How many servers, more specifically, do you have running? Is it more than four? Right? Performance is a feature. SQL is not cheap. When you get to Microsoft and you go, yeah, we're running SQL at this size. They literally do the like cartoon like dollars in the eyes thing. <laughs> and they go, cool, let's talk. How many cores are you running on each device? Oh, geez, it's a lot. 64, I think. 64 cores. It might be 256. It's a lot of cores. How many, how many CPUs? I don't remember. I think it's four. And I think the H one is 64 cores. I think. That's a tremendous amount. Yeah, it's insane. Like it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's insane. Uh, I saw a hand in the back. Roughly, what is your SQL spin? Define spin? Like how much does it cost to get annually? One more time? How much does it cost annually for your SQL server instances? It's a half a million dollars. On paper, lots. We are partners with Microsoft who contribute greatly to their ecosystem and under NDA beta test the new versions of SQL, so it's very cheap. We have a mutually parasitic relationship. <laughs> We are, we are one of the biggest uh, cases of scale of a .NET application, quite frankly. And so they use us to beta test a lot of things in the framework and SQL, and in exchange, we get cheap deals. So um, I'm not allowed to disclose the numbers, but on paper, it would be in the tens of millions of dollars over a couple of years, for sure. So SQL's not cheap, and that's why using less of it is good. Yeah? 60, 64 cores, half a million. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So 64 core servers, half a million bucks on paper before anything else. Plus, you got to buy support plans, yada, yada, yada. Two Redis servers, one master, one replica, 1% CPU, peak two. Really getting our value out of those servers. 
3.75 billion operations per day, 60,000 ops a second. Right? That's your caching value right there. Two servers running the whole thing. One's a replica for failover and or load distribution. One runs everything hot. Yeah? Do you guys have a tool to monitor that? What do you guys use for monitoring? Observer. Observer. Observer has native Redis plugs. Also has SQL plugs and .NET plugs and actually hardware plugs. There's a bus that you can plug into, kind of like a profiler for modern servers. Um, it plugs into that and reads your, reads your data immediately if you're at the data center to do it. Three tag engine servers. What's a tag engine? We realized that most of Stack Overflow is displaying lists of questions, and doing that sorting and stuff in the database is very expensive. You generally don't want to sort in the database. You want to sort in the front end if you can get there. So what the tag engine does is basically a giant uh, custom sort of uh, set theory application that takes a question ID and a set of metadata about the question, and then it uses that to do computations to sort them. And then we take the IDs as the output, and we query the database for those specific IDs. So it's a way to get around SQL. And it's not a knock on SQL. Any database is bad at sorting in memory. And so to get away from that, we build a proprietary version of it that sorts outside of it. Uh, 64 gigs of RAM, it does about 60 requests a second. 3% um, CPU, peak 5. And why does it only do 60 requests a second? Because we cache the heck out of the output. Right? On our site, 91% of all traffic is, is anonymous users. Who here has an account? I'm guessing well, that's actually pretty darn good. Most of the time, it's about 1 in 10 people, which means 9 out of 10 can share a cached, read-only, anonymous user view. Try to figure out what your not unique views are and cache them. Three Elasticsearch servers. Hey, I didn't reinvent a, C, you know, a search engine. Good for me. Uh, 196 gigs of RAM. They're load balanced. Elasticsearch is really good at load balancing. Fun story, when we first started using Elasticsearch, we didn't realize that you have to kind of tell it not to try and join other clusters. And so everybody's Elasticsearch has joined everybody else's Elasticsearch in the subnet. And then we had a giant mega Elasticsearch cluster of way too much stuff, including dev stuff, and it was terrible. So understand your tools. But once you get them right, 7% um, CPU, peak 20, 34 million searches a day. And the index is about half a terabyte at this point for all the sites. Two HA proxy servers. Anybody know what HA proxy is? It's a load balancer. That's all it is. Um, it's a programmable one that does drain and a bunch of other stuff. Drain is where you can uh, tell a, it to pull a particular server out of rotation after the traffic leaves it. It's really useful for doing things like rolling deployments. Um, one live, one failover, 5.5 billion requests per month, 4,500 a second, 10% CPU peak. I think that says 18. I can look right here. 18. And then we have WebSockets supported there too, 600,000 concurrent. Uh, what do we use WebSockets for? When you upvote in real time, other people see the upvote or downvote, that kind of thing, or comments getting added. Those are all WebSocket push notifications. So in total, right on time, what do we learn? Start with what you know. A uh, buddy of mine, coworker Jason Punyon, really smart guy, he tried to build a new app back in like 2013, and he decided he would do it on Cassandra DB without understanding Cassandra DB. And the whole thing was a total failure. Not, not really his fault, but sort of his fault. And he blogged about it because we're, you know, we're a culture of learning. So he blogged, here's why this was a terrible idea and all the mistakes I made and I should have just used SQL because that's what I knew. So I'm not saying use SQL or .NET. I'm saying use what you know and what you are mostly an expert on or most expert on because that's going to be half the battle right there. How do you profile something if you don't even know how to plug into the profiler? Right? If you have this kind of knowledge or, or intuition about, it, about a framework or a tech stack, use it. Right? You want to be the, the mean stack? Great. It's just as good as .NET. In some ways better, in some ways worse. Use the thing you know. Measure performance, but use existing tools. I don't need to harp on that. Don't reinvent things. Fix and replace the slow things. Again, with existing tools, don't reinvent your own unless you absolutely have to. Logs are a gold mine, but only if you mine them. If you don't mine them, they are rotting and costing you money, and they are worthless. So get on it or, get a, or stop, stop logging them. Just be honest with yourself. Measure and tune your database, because it is probably what's failing more often than not in your application most of the time. Solve actual problems instead of future ones. That's the biggest one, probably. Don't over-engineer things. Lazy load the problems till you get there, and then solve them. And performance is a cost-saving feature. Right? It can help you with search engine ranks. It can also uh, save you a lot of money if you don't need as many servers as, as you might when you have code that's not measured and tuned appropriately. Um, if anybody wants a photo, let me know. I'll hold this up for a second. Cool. That sounds fun. This is my last plug. Come work with us. S.TK, sweet domain, right? Slash jobs. Uh, we are hiring like mad, right? I know it's kind of a recession economy with a lot of tech bubble bursting. 
Um, we planned for that for once. We had a bad time in 2017 with some layoffs, quite honestly, because we didn't plan for it. We learned from that. And we're in really good shape right now, and we are hiring like crazy. I think I have 21 dev roles. So, you know, if this sounds fun and I don't seem like a jerk boss, give me a call. That's the whole thing. Thank you so much.